All right, so as promised, here's the video that's going to talk about conservation of energy. And the first idea that we got to discuss is an idea of categorizing forces into two main categories. We've talked about forces in a lot of different ways this semester. But when you're talking about energy and potential energy in particular, you have to identify whether the force is conservative or non-conservative. Conservative forces are what you would call path independent. So gravity is an example of this. If you start at some point, let's just call it point one, and you got to get up to point two, conservative, point, conservative forces, they don't care about how you get there. So in other words, if you're going from the first floor of a building to the seventh floor, you could go up to the third floor, stop, walk around, get out, go to the bathroom, go up to the fifth floor, then go back down to the fourth floor. As long as you ended up at the seventh floor, this, this conservative force idea just cares about where you start and where you end up. What happens in between does not matter. So conservative forces are called path independent. And because of that, they're very, very easy to work with. And it turns out that a lot of the forces that we talk about that are very important to us with potential energy are conservative forces like gravity and like the spring force. Other forces like friction are considered non-conservative. So back here because they do depend on the path that you take. Friction is something that depends on contact between two surfaces. So in other words, instead of taking a straight line from point one to point two, if you're gonna take a longer path, that means that those two surfaces are rubbing for a longer amount of time. So that's more friction, that's more work done by friction, that energy is not conserved. So that's the basic idea between conservative and non-conservative, and I've given you examples of each of those. Okay, just to go into this a little bit deeper, the true test or the, the requirement for a force to be conservative is that let's say you take some pathway from one point to another, and then you go back to your original position. If the total work done by a force around any closed path such as that is zero, so in other words, if you go somewhere and then you return to your original place, if the total work done by the force in question adds up to zero, then the force is conservative. So if I carry a box up the stairs and I'm looking at gravity, for example, when I'm carrying a box up the stairs, gravity is working in the downward direction. So gravity would be doing negative work as I carry it up. When I bring it back down, now the displacement of that box is in the same direction as gravity, so that would be positive work. So the up is negative work done by gravity, the down is positive work done by gravity, and those two values are equal, so they add up to zero. Most forces involving like a push or a pull or friction or a lot of everyday forces fall into this category, which is non-conservative. And the basic idea for non-conservative is if it is not conservative, if it doesn't meet this requirement, then it's not conservative. So if I push a box across the table, I'm pushing it in the same direction that it's moving, and then I push it back, I'm again pushing it in the same direction that it's moving. So those two work amounts are both positive and they do not cancel. That's non-conservative. Okay? Okay. All right, so to switch gears just a little bit, now that we are kind of, hang on, now that we're kind of caught up on the difference between this basic idea of conservative and non-conservative, we can talk about this new quantity. It's not new to you, but it's new to uh, talking about it formally in class. We're gonna talk about potential energy. Basic idea is energy that has yet to be released or energy that is stored. The symbol that we use for energy is capital U, and again, it's joules, just like other energy forms that we've talked about so far. So here is a basic equation that we've already been working with. Work is equal to the integral of the dot product of the total force and the displacement. Well, it turns out that that is equal to the opposite of the change in potential energy. So here's what I mean. If you start up at the top of some hill, let's say you're a snow skier. If you start up at the top of some hill, gravity does work to bring you down to the bottom. In going from top to bottom, you are actually losing potential energy. And how much you change is the negative of the work done to bring you there. So if I rewrite that and focus in here, 
Um, change in potential is just like change in anything else. You take the ending amount minus the beginning amount. And we, we know that when you change your potential, it is equal to the negative of the work done. So if I rewrite the work formula that we already know in terms of the change of potential energy, you basically have the opposite of the integral of the dot product of force and displacement. This right here is the definition of the potential energy function. So I'm going to leave this here for a second, but you should pause it and write all this down. All right. All right, so that's the relationship between work, which we've been dealing with all unit, and now this new kind of idea with potential energy. Well, if you wanna just look at potential energy and how it changes, I'm gonna just pan down here. Here's a basic definition. For any tiny little displacement, or we call that an infinitesimal displacement, DL, we can define the change of potential energy as DU, just like we always talk about it. any tiny change in a quantity is D followed by the quantity in question. Okay, so a tiny change of potential energy is equal to the negative dot product of force and that same tiny little change of position. So this right here is the tiny change of potential energy that we will integrate in order to find the overall change in potential energy. Okay, so let's look at this du for the force of gravity. Okay, so if I go down here, if you're just looking at for gravity, finding the tiny change in potential energy is equal to the negative force dot dl in a, uh, dot product, okay? So this negative is that right there. Now the force of gravity is a downward force, so I'm putting a minus in there for mg, and in this case that's just 9.8, so the negative 9.8 has been made explicit right here. And that's in the j direction because it's up and down. So this right here, this whole thing, is your minus F, and then you're gonna go dot DL. Well, DL is just the tiny little change in each of the three directions, so that's DX in the I plus DY in the J plus DZ in the K. And you might be able to see this already, but if you've got a J for your force, only the J term in the DL is gonna survive because if you recall, the dot product of any two perpendicular unit vectors is zero. So the X term drops off, the k term drops off. This is just fancy vector language for saying that this is only going to do work or change potential energy in the y direction. And what you end up with is just positive mg dy. So this is your du. So if we integrate this, here's what you're going to have next. Okay, so here you've got u, the total potential energy, is equal to the integral of this tiny little du, which we found to be plus mg dy. So now I'm just integrating this. And in this case, if you integrate it without any starting and ending point, that's an indefinite integral. So this is over all space. And here's what you end up with. Um, basically, m and g are constants, so they just stay put. You're integrating really just the dy. And the integral of dy is just y. So you get up here with mass times the acceleration of gravity times the vertical position or the y position plus some unknown constant energy. Because remember, when you're taking an indefinite integral, you have to assume that there was some constant. When you take the derivative of this constant, it goes away. So this is just some arbitrary zero point. Now, this is only true for indefinite integrals. Now, this turns out to be very, very important in physics with gravity because here's what you have. You get this equation right here. And I'm just gonna put a box around this. Okay, this right here, um, if you call this zero, which is what we do with energy at the ground, we just say that it has potential energy zero. So you can kind of make this potential initial. You can start wherever you want. The starting point doesn't really matter because with potential energy, all you care about is the distance from that starting point. So it makes it real easy to just say, that's gonna be zero. And now this should look like your freshman year, or sophomore year potential energy equation. Mass times gravity times height. This is the formula for gravitational potential energy near Earth's surface. So this is a very specific place. This is not just potential energy anywhere. It's potential energy due to gravity near Earth's surface. Write that down. Okay, now we're gonna talk just real fast about springs because you can do the exact same exercise for springs. If you start out with a tiny little change in potential energy due to some slight displacement of a spring, 
same starting point, except now we have a different spring force, which we know is negative kx. So if I, and the other thing that makes springs nice is they only operate in one direction. So I can kind of skip all the whole um, i hat, j hat, k hat thing, and just look at the x direction. So I get a negative force because of this negative sign right here times the unit vector dx in the i hat direction. So this is simplified. And then if I plug in my value for f, I get negative times negative kx, which is the force exerted by a spring. All that times a tiny little displacement. This is me stretching the spring out. And if I simplify that, I just get minus kx dx, which is the du, change, the tiny little change of potential energy for a spring. So if I integrate that, you're taking the integral of kx dx over all space. k is a constant. The integral, the antiderivative of x is just x squared over 2. So you end up with that term right here, 1 half x squared over 2 is the integrand, and the k just stayed put because it was a constant. And then you've got this arbitrary integration constant because it's an indefinite integral, okay? Well, when you don't stretch a spring at all, that potential energy is at x equals 0 unstretched. That goes away. So you end up with the potential energy of a spring, which we already knew, but now you know how to derive it a priori from first principles using calculus. There it is. Okay, so now we're going to kind of back out and put all this together with the idea of conservation of energy. We've talked about kinetic, we've talked about work, we've talked about potential. Now we're going to put it all together. Okay, so this is the part that we really needed to get to. Now this right here should look familiar. This is the work kinetic energy theorem. We've done this, so this is just kind of a review. And what you're talking about with this theorem is a specific particle or an object. We're going to make this a little more general now so that you can talk about an entire system. And we'll talk a lot more about systems in class next time so you can get an idea for how that works. But if you take the work kinetic energy theorem and you combine them with what we know about potential energy, we're going to get to the relationship between kinetic and potential, which is what lies behind conservation of energy. So it turns out that if you're talking about a total system, um, there's a more general way to write the total work. Because if you're talking about a system, that means you have to define what is inside and outside the system. So there can be work done by forces outside the system. This is the term right here that represents work done by forces outside the system. This is work external. Inside the system, I talked about how forces can be either conservative or non-conservative, like gravity is conservative and like friction is non-conservative. So these two forces are forces being done inside the system. So these two are inside. This is done by forces outside. If you total all that up, you get the absolute total of the work done on the system. Okay, if you rearrange these things a little bit, all I did here was subtract conservative forces work to this side. So you get the total minus the work done by conservative. Um, we know now that the work done by conservative forces is equal to the change in potential energy, the negative of the change in potential energy. This is a definition that I just went through with you, and it's not labeled with a C here, but I specified that this work and change in potential energy relationship, this is only applicable for conservative forces. So now, if I substitute in for this minus work conservative, and I know that work conservative is the negative of the change in potential energy of that system. Here's what I get. Uh, sorry, hang on one second here. I'm basically going to take this positive change in potential and substitute it in for this negative work conservative. All right,